Hello everyone. So today we are going to be moving, as uh, we have been discussing, uh, through our process of exploring qualitative data analysis, moving into beyond the coding stage by where we're moving from the descriptive to the analytical. So what does it mean to identify the codes and uh, categories that we are looking at? Um, what do we do with these ideas that are coming forward and how do we put them in together through an analytical stance that presents a theory or an emerging response to our research question. And so you have a video this week that discusses the concept of grounded theory. Uh, grounded theory is a very popular and important uh, approach to theorizing and qualitative research developed by researchers Glazer and Strauss. Um, there's a lot of material on it. What I want to do for this course is really to provide an introductory level uh, uh, to this theory. Um, it's very dense and complex, but, uh, but I'm going to pull apart some of the key things that are important to know about grounded theory. Um, so in particular, grounded theory is an inductive approach. Um, so the goal here is to generate theory that is grounded in the data. So the theory is really coming from the data rather than from a literature or existing hypotheses. Um, so theory that's grounded in the data through some key elements. Um, and uh, in particular, grounded theory uh, challenges the existing sort of, uh, at the time that it came forward, uh, the deductive or, or hypothesis testing approach um, and sort of questioned whether that was just verifying existing ideas and, uh, and wanted to use qualitative research actually to, to explore new ideas that are coming forward in the data. And this is one of the things that we're excited about, about qualitative research is that it can really, um, it can really uh, explore new ideas. So how do we generate theory that is coming from our data rather than pre-existing notions that have already been placed on us? And so uh, there's some key elements of grounded theory that we can actually use in general when we think about theory building. So one of the one of the main elements of grounded theory is, is the con the constant comparison idea. So you're constantly going back to the data and comparing what you're getting out of the data across multiple data points. Uh, and this is going to be important to you when you're looking at multiple transcripts and getting different data points, different perspectives from different people and in different interviews, and comparing and contrasting them. Um, and so you're you know in this constant comparison you develop what they call concepts, um, and you relate concepts to one another. Um, so you can compare concepts to really develop categories. And again, we don't want to get too caught up in if something's a quote, a, a code or a concept, but it is important, this comparison piece to, uh, to constantly being comparative. And the focus on process is also very important where it's iterative. So you're going back to the data. And so you're looking for newness and contradictions when you're developing these ideas. Um, and you're doing this iteratively. So you might compare a few data points and say, oh, something interesting is happening here and name a concept and then compare some more data points and see how that reaffirms your concept or challenges your concept and then might lead to new concepts. So it's this constant comparison. It's this iterative process. Um, what's also very important in grounded theory is this idea of theoretical sampling. And so you, you look for new points of data, you interview new people, or you engage in new data collection until you get something that's called theoretical saturation. And this is when you're starting to see the same thing come out in the interviews. And so then you know you're probably, you're probably not going to get new information, um, you're not getting new data that's refining your ideas, you're just hearing the same stuff over and over again. That's theoretical saturation. Um, but the really big important point of grounded theory is the creation of theory. Um, that really is coming from the data um, and that you're creating categories, they, they use the term core categories that come out of the subcategories that really inform your theory. So essentially, you know, for our purposes, we can think of this as the next level of coding, um, that we're, we're doing that iterative process, we're building from the very specific to something more abstract um, that is interpretive, um, and we're doing that towards uh, creating a theory. So rather than just describing what's happening in the data, we want to analyze what's happening in the data. We want to use the data 
to, uh, to get at some broader understanding of the process or the question that we've been asking, that we've collected the data in for in the first place. So what does all this have to do with you? Um, so as I've mentioned, um, we're, we're, we're introducing grounded theory um, not because I want you to get concerned with the intricacies of this approach. Um, you're not expected to take up grounded theory at all in this course or for your final assignment. But it is important to know about the general principles because this can tell us about how we might approach theory making in general. And in particular, how can your own theory making be grounded? Um, and so how can it be grounded in a very general term as opposed to having to apply the specifics of the concepts of grounded theory? But let's think about this idea of grounded. And so, you know, one of the first ways that you ground your theory is by, by, by grounding it in your question. Um, and so you're going to have to develop a question for your own analysis here. And it's very important that you think about what that question is very deeply, uh, rather than just choosing a question just because I've suggested it to you. Um, what are you most interested in asking of our data set? Um, and what does it mean to theorize? Or what might it mean? Or how can we approach the concept of theorizing out of this data, as opposed to just describing what we see in the data? So what is theorizing? So here's some ways of thinking about theor theory. You, you know, you want to suggest an explanation. Um, so rather than, again, rather than describing, you're explaining. You're interpreting to the point where you're actually coming up with some, some explanations, some processes that you see happening. Um, you want to step back and see the bigger picture. So you're looking at broader meanings. You're abstracting from specifics to the broader implications of the things that you're observing in the data. Um, and this might be a nice thing to focus on because we did have a discussion a few weeks ago about not wanting to pull the data apart so much that we don't see the whole of, of what we're looking at because in qualitative research we're very interested in, in the bigger picture. Um, and we can't know the complete picture as we've discussed many times, but we want to understand very deeply the picture of what we're looking at in, in this particular context, in this particular uh, group of people that we're, we're, we're engaging with. Um, and so we are sort of, you know, we've coded the data to kind of make it a, a, a able to analyze, make it accessible for us to analyze. But now we want to put it back together in a bigger picture to really be able to make some, some, some observations and some an, a, analyses about it um, that helps us see that bigger picture. And so this is really very much a creative process as much of qualitative research is. So we're producing frameworks, we're producing sometimes analogies or metaphors to explain what we're seeing um, and, and to situate it. So the concept of theorizing, um, another way of putting it is to situate and explain. Um, and again, really to, to, to analyze what we're seeing. And you can do this uh, in many ways. And one way, which if you're working in groups for your assignment, you will be doing, is a participatory way. So you can do this in, as an individual without um, engaging with other individuals, or you can do it in a very deeply engaged way where you're, you're working with other people. And sometimes um, you're even, in the case of my work, for example, you're even, even working with the people who are the subjects of your analysis. So um, especially when we talk about the kind of power analyses that, uh, that we've brainstormed and discussed a lot in this class, um, in some qualitative research, we think it's imperative that we do this kind of an analysis with the participants of our research. And in fact, there are co-researchers. And we don't see a difference between the participants and the researcher in terms of the analysis that we want to engage in this together. However, that can be challenging. And it even will be challenging um, to do it in, in, the, in the group context of, of the assignment that you've been uh, asked to engage if you do choose to use a group context to do that. And so what are the pros and cons of this participatory approach? Well, you have a reading this week that talks very deeply about many uh, uh, examples of projects by Flickr and Nixon, um, where they did take a participatory approach to analysis and even to writing up the results of qualitative research. Um, and so this might help, for, help you when you're trying to decide whether you want to work in groups, either for this assignment, for this course, or um, if you're going to be doing qualitative research in the future, and how, how participatory do you want it to be. Um, so certainly, and uh, this is, goes to the points I was just making, many of the benefits of qualitative uh, research in, in being participatory or choosing a participatory approach is the concept of, of democratizing the analysis. So working with diverse stakeholders, 
flipping the power dynamics so it's not the researcher who's coming up with all of the uh, quote-unquote theory or answers, um, but that it's a group collaborative process and very much informed by the perspectives and the readings of the, the research um, from those with the lived experiences about the research. Um, so, you know, it becomes very important when we're talking about uh, participatory research that we do that in a way that honors that participation, that honors that, that, that power sharing and honors the, sh the shift of power uh, to theorizing coming from people with the lived experience with the issues that we're examining. It also can share the workload. That's probably a big reason why you might want to do your assignment, your final assignment in groups. As I mentioned last week, uh, coding is, uh, you know, a lengthy process. Uh, as much of the processes as you learn from your transcription assignment, uh, much of the processes in, in qualitative research are quite lengthy. Um, so uh, having multiple people do coding can uh, help tackle the fact that you have lots of data to code. Um, it also enhances rigor, as I also discussed last week, because when you have multiple people looking at something, and then you compare and contrast what they're seeing, you can you can say, okay, we're, we're more confident about, about what we're seeing because we've been able to refine it through multiple lenses or multiple people being able to say, I see the same thing, which can confirm that we're seeing something that has validity, or I see something different, which, which can adapt what we're seeing and make it um, maybe give it more, more complexity, uh, which can help it help lead to its validity because we're not just seeing it in a narrow dimension, we're seeing it in a multi-dimensional way. Uh, qualitative research can also, uh, sorry, uh, participatory uh, research can also really facilitate knowledge to action. Um, so if you're working with multiple stakeholders, if you're in particular working with stakeholders who have, um, you know, uh, need for social action around a particular issue, which is often the case when we're working um, in participatory research, um, we're often dealing with something that requires attention. And that's why we're trying to get uh, people with lived experiences voices on it, because it's something that is an issue of equity that hasn't, hasn't been dealt with and we need to create some kind of social action around it. And so when we come to awareness raising together, um, we hope, and the goal of this work, is that there will be an ability to mobilize that, that knowledge. Of course, uh, it is challenging to work in groups. Um, it, it requires facilitation often. It requires a lot of coordination. If you're doing the kinds of projects that you'll read about in the Flickr, Flickr and Nixon article, um, you're talking about a lot of people and a lot of complexity to deal with. Um, and research, as you can probably have already picked up uh, from what you've done in this course, is already very complex. So when you layer on that, the complexity of working across multiple settings with multiple people, um, that, that re requires really good facilitation skills and really good coordination. It also can be very challenging, this notion of sharing power. It can be a wonderful thing to think about, but a challenging thing to practice. Um, and that can be due to institutional contexts that make it hard to share power. In, in general, when we're talking about research, research tends to benefit uh, the people from the formal context, which is usually a university kind of setting. And we have to find ways for it to benefit people who are outside of that setting, but um, it, that can be challenging to do. Um, so how finding ways to do that is, is, is important, um, but also challenging. Um, it's also interesting to talk about authorship when we think about participatory and research, and participatory writing. Um, so, you know, again, institutional contexts of university settings tend to place the authorship on the researcher, the lead researcher, the person whose um, name is on the ethics protocol, the person who wrote the grant application, perhaps, or who is taking um, institutional control over the, leader, over the research. Um, but of course, when we're thinking about wanting to be power sharing, that doesn't really share the uh, results of the research and the benefits of the research, especially if writing and producing writing is a key benefit. Um, so, you know, increasingly we're seeing challenges to authorship models where we can put community members' names as authors on the papers and, and must do so. Uh, but that can be a challenge. Some, some journals don't recognize co-researchers or people with lived experience who may not have actually spent a lot of time writing the paper but who contributed much authorship to the paper. Some journals don't see those people as authors, so there's still institutional models and challenges. Uh, to these these kinds of uh, these kinds of approaches, 
Um, and that requires capacity building. So sometimes we have to educate funders. Sometimes we have to educate uh, uh, people who control the, the submissions to journals. We have to educate um, many different people about why we have to be more power sharing when it comes to research in order to uh, do these very complex participatory analyses. So, so this is, you know, this is this is a general discussion about um, how you engage in this work in a participatory way, which I think will be important um, to the kinds of questions that you may want to ask in your own qualitative research work. Um, but then again, coming back to your particular assignment, what's important to think about is really the challenges around sharing workload and the benefits around sharing workload, and also how you want to create knowledge together that is not compartmentalized. So I think I mentioned if you're choosing to do this uh, assignment in a group, uh, it doesn't mean that you would say, okay, you go off and do this part of the assignment and I'll do this part of the assignment and then we'll just put it all together the day before we hand it in and make some fine, some, some small edits, and, and then we've got our assignment completed. You really have to engage in each step of the process of analysis and writing together. Um, otherwise, you're not really going to produce a coherent piece of, of, of qualitative analysis. And so again, in the uh, Flickr and Nixon uh, article, they, uh, they've developed a model called Depict, um, which is, which is uh, several steps of how you can engage in uh, doing a participatory analysis together. Uh, so it, it sets out how you might each code a different transcript and then come back together and review how you've coded the transcripts and develop collaborative uh, categories and codes together. Um, and so you might want to use some steps. You certainly won't be doing this complete model. Um, this is much more about working in the field. Um, but this might, uh, first of all, it's a really interesting model to think about if you're interested in participatory research. Um, but also it might give you some cues as to how to go about doing your own collaborative piece of research if you're working in groups for the final assignment. Um, and uh, you may wish to reference some of these steps in the model. Um, you don't have to, but it's one option for you to do um, when you're describing how you approached your analysis. And so let's talk a little bit more about this idea of moving from descriptive to analytical. What does that mean? So the descriptive is really exactly what it sounds like. You're describing. You're saying what is happening. You're saying who and what and where and when it happened. You're really just providing the facts that are coming out of the data. The analysis is when you're doing that, again, yet another level of interpretation, and you're asking, what does it mean? Um, you're asking questions of how and why. You're stepping back a bit from the data, or you're moving up a level of abstraction from the data, and you're asking these questions of what, why am I seeing what I'm seeing? So descriptive is what are you seeing? And analytical is why are you seeing it? What do you think it means? And again, this is an interpretive process. This is a subjectively interpretive process. Different people will have different answers to the analytical questions, um, but this is the richness of engaging in this kind of analysis. So the descriptive states what happened. It gives the story so far. It gives the information that is coming out of the data. It does that usually in the order in which things happened. Um, and it, uh, it, it, it's, it's bringing out sometimes links between the things that have happened, but it's very much at the level of providing that information, giving information. The analytical starts to look, about, look into significance. Um, why is this important? It may judge the strengths or weaknesses of a particular piece of information. And sometimes in being analytical, you're, you're being analytical when you decide what go goes into your analysis and what, what stays out of your analysis and why. Um, and, and so it makes judgments about what is important in this analysis and, um, and identifies why it chose the things it chose. That's a process of being analytical or critically looking at the data. Um, weighs uh, the importance of, of one piece of information over another um, and also draws conclusions. So looks at links between the data, and that's where we're getting, we're getting more analytical the more categorizing that we're doing. Of course, as we're categorizing, we're naming things, and in naming things, we're, 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 we're providing an interpretation on it. But then when we get up that next level and we start to really develop theory and drawing conclusions, that's where we're really developing a process of an analysis. And Depict has some really nice guiding questions. So even if you don't use 
a participatory framework, you can still use these questions to help guide your analysis, to help move from the descriptive to the analytical. So the dep depict re reflection questions uh, in description, they're asking for, you know, what do you see as the main ideas coming forward here? Where is their agreement? What are some key quotes? Um, where, where are there silences that might be important? And then the analytical is again going into the what and the why. What, what does it all mean? Why is it happening? Um, uh, what are the most important findings? Who do we need to share this with? Um, and, and also maybe even stepping back to think about structural factors. You saw this in the Inuit food insecurity article. Structural factors that we need to, we need to think about to help us understand these stories that people are telling us. I think you're all, as, as third year environmental studies students, probably pretty, pretty, interested, pretty used to hearing this idea of bringing structural factors into your analysis. And so let's go back to the example that I shared last week about my Making with Place project. So I shared with you how we moved from coding to identify themes, uh, uh, broader themes coming out of our data. So we coded our data, we identified um, specific things in our data that were, that were being discussed, and then we developed some themes and then theories out of that data. So uh, here's an example of, of some theorizing around the idea of place as an internal landscape. So the Making with Place project, to, to refresh your memories, uh, brought a number of young people together from diverse lived experience perspectives to talk about this idea of what is place. And of course, we ended up doing that during the pandemic. Um, right in the middle of the shutdowns of the pandemic. Um, and we, that wasn't our plan. We didn't know about the pandemic when we created the, 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 the goals of the research. We were interested in, in place and public art. But um, the pandemic changed that in many interesting ways and place became a, a, a different thing to consider and, and think about. Not just the pandemic, but also the, the uprisings around racial injustice that came out during the pandemic. So you had some very interesting things happening, especially when you talk about diverse uh, and lived experience perspectives. Um, so we had codes around identity, physical body, memory, emotion, and we saw those, we grouped those, we categorized those under this idea of an internal landscape. And then we started to think about what is the theory that's coming out of this? And here's an example of a, co a quote. Uh, I shared this one last week as well, um, where uh, this is a direct quote from one of the participants that we labeled um, with multiple codes that then ca came to be categorized under, under this idea of place as an internal landscape. And I also mentioned that this image was also coded with that. Um, this image that you see in the corner, which is of a brain and a dandelion um, kind of growing through the brain, which is a metaphor for this idea that comes up in this quote here around intrusive thoughts. So this participant's talking about how um, during isolation, there's this time to be really acquainted with ourselves and how hard that can be and how there's often intrusive thoughts that come in waves um, and, and they're sort of spiral um, and, and are hard to manage. Um, and this is the idea of the brain being invaded by the invasive dandelions. And, that, and so you can see that both in the quote and also in the piece of art that was created, we are pulling out quote, qu codes, we're pulling out ideas, we're pulling out concepts, we're grouping them together, and then we're coming up with this theory, or uh, this, this maybe uh, grounded theorists might, might call it a core concept uh, or core category um, that is uh, this idea of place as an internal landscape. And here's how we wrote about it when we actually wrote up. And this is, uh, this is actually a piece of writing done by my colleague, Felix Novak. So I want to acknowledge her authorship um, on this. Um, uh, and Phyllis took this idea of place as an internal landscape and started to write theory or started to engage in writing um, on the theorizing that we're doing in relation to this. So Phyllis uh, talks about how um, many conversations illuminated uh, the artist researchers' struggles with the pandemic uh, uh, dis disproportionately affecting those who are marginalized and racialized. Um, and this it revealed injustice as place to be subjective, contextual, and situated. So the places that they were coming from and the situations and the locations that they were coming from were places that were very um, meaningfully uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, experientially in relation to the pandemic. 
Um, and, uh, and this was, you know, expressed, Phyllis goes on to say, expressions of exhaustion, overwhelm, fear, rage, and grief resulted in diverse tensions from a sense of immobility to a passion sense of urgency to be on the front lines, which is a quote from one participant. Um, so this is, you know, the, she goes on to say that uh, this highlighted the impacts of, of their internal landscape is an identified place. So here we're unpacking what we mean by this theorizing around places and internal landscape. And then going on to talk about how um, this, this hyper-realization of racialization revealed itself not just as a social construct, but also as P states to be embodied in our physical bodies, our minds, and our communities. So again, and, and this is again a quote from a participant talking about this idea of place being an embodied thing. Um, so this is unpacking and theorizing around this idea or this meta idea that's coming out of the data, um, linking it, grounding it in the data, using quotes from participants to describe and go beyond um, um, description into the analysis of the data and to really unpack and give uh, a deep idea about the theory that is coming forward. And in your Cresswell reading, reading for this week, um, you will see a figure that talks about the data analysis spiral um, from managing the data to the memos on the data to interpreting the data and then to representing the data or, or, or even visualizing the data. Um, and so this is what we're moving through. Um, and uh, we're, you know, we, we've talked about you know, coding the data or identifying the, the, the main things in the data. Then we've talked now We've talked about categorizing that. Now we're talking about using those categories to build theories. And how do we then represent that data? How do we then communicate that back? Well, you can, you can and should and must use quotes to be grounded in the data. So really, if that's one thing that we want to think about for this lecture, it's the grounding in the data by really always going back to the data and using the data to support our theory. So we often do that uh, use and, and must do that by providing direct quotes that illustrate what we're, what we're talking about. Um, and usually we do that also with quotes that are in data tables. So we create tables where we have on one side the, the code and then on the other side illustrative quotes that tell us something about that code um, and, and, and are, are represented in the table format so that we can see all of the codes grouped and then quotes that, that show us what that code means. We also might do that using stories and metaphors. Um, the metaphor of the brain invaded by the dandelion uh, is an example that I just shared. Stories uh, come out of our data very often, and so communicating back those stories using things like metaphor can also be a very useful way of presenting qualitative data. And again, we also sometimes often see data rep represented in figures or models. You saw a model in the Inuit Food and Security article that provided a nice image. Uh, so images using figures or models um, that link the codes, that link the theories, um, that, that, uh, that show us in a, in, a, in a model format the process that we're describing. So theory usually describes some kind of process and often we can use models to also visually depict that process. Images and other kinds of artistic approaches are also used to represent data. Increasingly we're th seeing things like theory, and even poetry um, and, and visual representations of data um, being used in qualitative research. And we're going to get into some very specific examples of that in an, as, at the end of class. We'll have a couple of sessions on the arts and qualitative research, and you'll get to see some examples of representing data in, in sort of more artistic uh, ways. Uh, what we don't tend to see in qualitative research is data represented uh, the way quantitative data is. So we don't use graphs, we don't use pie charts, we don't use numbers. We use more metaphorical storytelling quotes um, and things that can, uh, can represent the data um, in, in more of a qualitative way. And here's an example of a data table. So this is from your reading this week by Wolf, Alice, and Bell um, that explores uh, climate change in Labrador and uh, did quite a lot of interviews. This is a really interesting reading to see an example of qualitative research in action. Uh, did 53 in-depth interviews um, in uh, two communities in Labrador and did a lot of comparing and contrasting and developed a lot of interesting theory. And what you can see in the, in the data tables here is just what I was speaking to. Here you've got a theory or a, a concept that's being um, articulated. 
and then you've got um, the different codes or the different um, sub sub concepts that, that that inform that theory. So tradition is being informed by this idea of connection to the past, food sustenance, knowledge of the land, and absence of entertainment technologies. Um, and then you see, as I just discussed, illustrative quotes that tell you um, exactly what that means, or from the for the very much the the, the words and the experience of the participants in the in the research. Um, uh, what 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 we're, we are calling this food sustenance? Here's the way the participant art articulated uh, something very meaningful in relation to that piece of data or that concept or that code. Um, and so this is exactly what I was speaking to in terms of representing data in the form of quotes and data tables. And so that's where I'm going to leave it off for today. We will go further uh, into the qualitative analysis spiral when we talk next week more about representing data so that you can think about how you might um, write up your findings into a qualitative research report. Um, and on our next Zoom call, our Zoom lecture for this module, we're going to visit and talk together about this idea of moving from the descriptive to the analytical using this video, I'm not an activist, but that it has been also assigned for your viewing this week. So we'll start off our next Zoom call watching the video together and then we'll have a discussion analyzing the content. I look forward to that and I hope you have a great week.